Hi, I'm Daniel Roberts, and you are listening to the Giving Town Podcast, where we share stories of hope and generosity in our wonderful community of Newburgh, Oregon, and the surrounding area. This podcast is sponsored by my real estate team, the Joyful Roberts Group, and we are licensed real estate brokers with Premier Property Group, LLC. We're passionate about serving our clients well and educating people about the many aspects of real estate. So if that's something you're interested in, you can check out our YouTube channel, which is linked in the description below. In today's episode, I am interviewing Brian Groves, a Newburgh community member and business owner who is involved with a project called United as Neighbors. In this episode, we'll be discussing what United as Neighbors is, how Brian got involved, and how we can learn to honor and respect the people we disagree with the most. If you know Brian, you know that he is always full of great insights and nuggets of wisdom, and this episode is no different. This is a topic that is especially relevant right now, so I hope you enjoy this episode and to learn some new tools that will help you to stay kind the next time you find yourself in a conflict. Thank you, Brian, for joining me today, and I'm looking forward to our conversation. Thanks, I'm joy being here. Well, let's just jump right in. So United as Neighbors, that's what we're here to talk about. Can you share what United what United as Neighbors is and what it's about? Sure. Well, I mean, it's simply a group of local Newburgh Dundee residents who started getting together not quite a year ago to see if we could have some kind of positive impact on the energy level in the town, especially around elections and politics um, that kind of came about um, during the, the worst of the time, if you will, during the school board and the flag controversy and all that stuff in the schools. Yeah. So how did you specifically get involved? Uh, well, the reason I got involved is because um, when we were having so much anger flying around the town, I realized that I was literally getting ill, um, not just because of what was happening in town, but because that's a reflection of what's happening nationwide. It's a reflection of what's happening in families, a reflection of what's happening in all kinds of communities. And I was just anxious and literally making myself sick over the fact that everything I said or everything I heard was coming through a filter of well, is this something that this person agrees with me on or they do they disagree with me on? Mm. And the world has become so divided. It uh, would get to the point where I'd meet somebody at a meeting or something like that and you're, I'm listening for triggers around, oh, which side of the fence are they on? Are they a friend or are they an enemy? And of course, that's an absurd way to live. And uh, yet, really, that's what's happened to a lot of us. Yeah. So we've been conditioned to meet people and listen to people, not because we're generally interested in what they may have to say, but we're trying to figure out whether they're on our side or not. Yeah. And it's interesting because we've had several conversations just through being at the Chamber of Commerce and um, we meet pretty much every Monday or every Friday, I should say. Um, and we've had many conversations about this and just the vitriol, I guess, of, of, of no matter what side, you're on, like you said it, there's a lot of animosity towards the other side. And when you step back and realize we're both, both the sides are kind of doing the same thing to each other. And there's, um, it's, it, and I've talked about this before. It's like a, almost like a propaganda or like the media machine. And everyone likes to blame the media and say, oh, they're doing this or they're doing that. But, you know, I think there really is something to we've, we've with algorithms and everything and everyone just being, in their own loop of personalized uh, ideas, they're fed their own ideas back to them. It's an echo chamber. And so anyone who's outside of that is just incomprehensible. Uh, and, and you've been around a little bit longer than I have. Has it always been this way though? There's been super divisive things in the past that people have disagreed on. So what what's different now? Well, that, that no, I don't think it's ever been this bad. Um, now I've watched... Uh, documentaries and things that do go back and talk about the politics of 50 years ago or 100 years ago. Some people will say it's really never changed. It's sort of always been that way. And I, But I think there's a difference between people disagreeing about a topic or what the right solution to a problem is versus people uh, demonizing someone simply because they disagree. Yeah. And I think that's uh, some sort of social illness that we have. 
that says, um, it's not okay for me to just advocate for what I believe in. It's not okay for me to vote for what I believe in or to support the people that I think um, represent me, but I need to go out and make sure I destroy anybody who has a different opinion. And that's a relatively new thing. I think it's a very sad thing and a thing I hope we can get past. Yeah. You know, and that's what this is all about, right? And that it is neighbors, at least it's it almost like a maybe prototype for the community of Newburgh and kind of the surrounding area of, okay, how could we do that? So you were, what are the people involved in kind of getting this going? I know it kind of came from a few different people, so it's, it's not your thing, but you're one of the people who kind of started and said, hey, let's, let's get together and, and talk about this. So, because uh, it originally started, correct me if I'm wrong, is the Newburgh.de conversation, or is that different? Well, there, so it it all depends on who you are and when you jumped into the pool, okay. if you will. So um, I can talk about my particular track, and that's just my experience because there have been people doing things uh, in the same vein for quite a while. Then. Right. So for I'll just talk about those. So for example, George Fox has a project called a Civility Project, and Ron Mock is in charge of that, and that's been going on, I believe, for a couple of years. Yeah, and I think we that was just like two or three episodes ago, or maybe a little bit longer. But yeah, we just seem to be wrong. Yeah. Um, and and I, I won't speak for Ron, but um, basically that's a project that George Fox saw to do or thought to do. Um, and its focus is um, sort of from its position as an educational institution uh, and a Christian institution, how can it help by bringing in speakers, um, conducting meetings to help the town, again, learn how to be nicer to each other. I don't know if the original charter of that was to kick off projects around town. I don't think it was. And that's one way that this maybe has differed or is separate from that. Um, this is more of a, what if we could get a bunch of people together who were on opposites. So this isn't about everybody conforming. This isn't about convincing someone to switch to my point of view or vice versa. This is about say, um, gosh, wouldn't it be great if instead of Newburgh being in the national news because of all horrible things happening yeah. with the school board or with the schools, Newburgh was in the news because in spite of the fact that there are differences in town about how people see things, Somehow the place has learned how to be civil toward each other and to be, to allow discourse to exist, to allow disagreement to exist. And instead of demonizing each other, actually go the other way. Say, no, I disagree with you, but I support your right to speak your mind. Yeah. And so the civility project is one. This is one. What are some others? Well, then uh, just this last weekend, of course, we were at the Old Fashioned Festival, and that's the first time that a bunch of these groups sort of came together under one banner, so to speak, because uh, there's a project called Nurture Newber with Denise Bacon. And that's been, I don't know all the history of that, but that's been going on again also for quite a while. And it very easily fit in with what we're doing. I don't even know, except for the fact that it is its own entity, I don't know if there's a big difference between what they're trying to do and what we're trying to do. There's another episode we just did with that. <laughs> so yeah, if it sounds similar, it is similar. Yeah. Um, and we're also not trying to duplicate or take over anything anyone else is doing. This is just a way to get people involved. Um, so we had our old fashioned festival booth and then mm -hmm. there's some other projects coming up that we're, we're trying to get going okay. as well. Well, and every project has its own flavor. So there's going to be some that are more attracted to one way of doing things or other. I mean, in all honesty, the Giving Town podcast is kind of the same thing. It's just an audio version. And my, well, I say it's like kind of a reverse propaganda, <laughs> just focusing all the things that are full of hope and focusing on the people who are generous with their time and their resources and whatever else and um, spread the message of that rather than, I mean, there's always going to be positive and negative. Right. Uh, so, so with that, what do you envision that function of the elite? look like and how that is going to engage the community beyond just, hey, this would be great if it was like this. Well, I don't think the United as Neighbors group per se has any kind of specific 
um, tangible goals we want to make sure happens. It's just, and in fact, the fact that there's lots of groups out there coming together or other people in different forms coming up with ways of helping to decrease the temperature of the town, that's perfect. There's no competition for that. It'd be great if there were a hundred groups in town doing that. People just sort of joined up with where they felt most comfortable. Yeah. But, um, and I don't know exactly where it's going to go other than we have uh, sort of a core group of about a dozen people who get together. We've been averaging about once a month, just trying to come up with ideas that we think might make the town a better place to live. Yeah. And so far, what that's turning into is connecting with other groups and just, uh, you know, joining in to find ways to, to do what we can. Yeah. Can you share some of the ideas or the things that you personally feel like, wow, this actually could really make a big difference? Well, one of, one of the things that a lot, one of the reasons I guess I'll go back to why I got started in this is one was because I was trying to give myself some sort of antidote to the sickness I was feeling from all the anxiety. And the other one is because I'm in the communication business, um, I was stunned to find how poor the communication was on both sides of the aisle when it came to the school board issue or some of the other things happening in town. Because if you think about it, no one ever converts somebody to their point of view by beating them over a head or shaming them or punishing them. It's it's one of the most, most ludicrous forms of communication. And yet human nature seems to very easily go there. Um, I think it's a self-protection mechanism. If you won't listen to me or you won't believe what I believe, I'm going to hurt you. That seems to be, for some reason, something humans do. So as a communications person, I just look at it and go, wow, if I'm really trying to convince somebody or a bunch of people that I have a good idea, the best way to do that is to have the person share why they think it's a good idea, letting people see the passion they may have for it, and treat them like adults who can make up their own minds yeah. and agree with it if they like and join the cause, so to speak, or if it's not for them, let them go their own way and say that's fine too, because no one has a lock on a wisdom or what is right or what is wrong. They just don't. And you shared something really interesting along those lines that media, whether it's Fox News or CNN or whichever side it's on, they kind of do the same subtle things of vilifying or um, kind of making a joke out of the other side. And um, I would just be personally, I grew up in a very conservative household and how have many people who are you know, much more liberal. And I've kind of seen that side and realized, oh, I grew up hearing on, um, you know, all the conservative talk shows that, well, the other side's so stupid. And if you had half a brain, you wouldn't vote that way. And now I was, you know, oh, I'm, now I get it. And it's really given me a lot of empathy to know, I know why this side believes what they believe, because I used to think very far that way. I know this side believes, because now I've been around it so much. And now most issues are not got to drive black and black, but we want to make it seem that way because it's easier to just have a strong opinion one way or the other. And the amount of wrestling I do on big social justice and all these different kinds of issues and really dig into uh, why each side believes what it believes it's honestly exhausting i believe it's necessary so i do it but i think our brains don't like using energy we always try to find shortcuts and so i my personal thought of that's kind of what we've done is we don't want to really think about it we just want to go yep i'm right and that confirms it and this person it's easier to believe it's someone else doesn't have the ability to functionally think rather than say wow maybe maybe i should actually pay attention to what they're talking about because there's something to it Right. Yeah. The, um, for, I think forever people have blamed the media or newspapers or, or whatever you want to talk, call it. Um, and I, I don't know who to blame, if you will, other than, um, they're in the business of giving people what they want mm -hmm. because in spite of the fact that certain networks or shows call themselves news shows, mm -hmm. really, we don't have news. News would be simply reporting. There was an accident on the corner of 99W and college. And, and two cars were involved. And no one would read it. <laughs> right. And that's the news. That's the news. 
But what ha what we have is, and you can just pick whatever your flavor would be. Let's say somebody was angry about um, green cars. They just thought green cars were evil. Let's say another accident was caused by a green car on the corner of 99. You actually have that green just meaning fuel efficient. Oh, yeah. I didn't mean green. As I know you did. Right. Or blue, so blue or red or whatever. Yeah. But yeah, no, I, but you, what you're talking about it actually exactly happens just with fresh. But anyway, I get what you're saying. Yeah. So, so, you know, those, those news organizations, if they call themselves or the, um, the uh, broadcasters who do opinion or talk show hosts or whatever, they're after an audience and their job is not only to keep their audience happy, but to feed them and grow that audience because that's how you get money from sponsors and things like that. So they've developed a very effective way of feeding us the fresh meat that we seem to like. So if they can get you angry about something that's not going your way, or they can get you angry about people that are standing in the way of you getting what you want, that's what they do. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that's kind of sad about that is, in a sense, we're all being played because... I think the world would be a better place if you announced what was happening and just gave the information and allowed people to decide how they feel about that. But that's not the way it works right now, and I don't know if that'll ever change. You know, there, that actually reminds me, um, what is it called? I should cook up my, my phone here. I think it's called the flip side. It's, uh, let's see if I got this right. Flip side news. And yeah, it's actually both sides. So you can't see this on the recording, but it's actually both sides of the aisle. It shares the opinion why each side believes it. And it helps you understand, oh, that's why they, they do that. It's not just about this one side and, you know, white out all the other reasons the other side believes that they believe. So it's actually a really interesting way to get news in a more neutral way. And I hope that that more people find things like that with um, being able to see both sides and, and recognize um, when it comes voting time, you can't just vote on one side of the aisle because that's what you are on. Um, you have to really think about it and it's hard to think, but I think it's important. To think. It's uh, and sometimes if you really do that, it's like, how can I with a good conscious vote for you? either side when I don't agree with everything, but you know, it's kind of like, who do we blame the drug dealer or the drug user? And, and, you know, everyone loves to complain about the media. And you're right. They're a business. They do what they do. And that's just the way that it is. So somehow we have to figure out how do we navigate that? How do we take responsibility for ourselves? Just because there's drug dealers around dealing heroin to pain doesn't mean we have to take it. And um, <laughs> with that, you know, there's no real way to use that responsibly. And maybe there's a way to use uh, news responsibly. But you had that really interesting thought of... Um, Watching both. You mentioned that. Over right. I see. Back around the beginning of this year, I started uh, watching or listening to both sides. Um, and by the way, a couple of things I want to share here is I'm, I'm not trying to be a peacemaker. I'm not a person who believes all opinions are equal or all ideas are just as good or all ideas are bad. I have very strong opinions of my own. But what I found was... I forced myself to listen to the other side for a while and to kind of go back and forth and listen. And I'm very glad I did because I discovered a couple of things. First of all, um, I, I gained some insight into when my guard will now come up, no matter which side of the aisle I'm listening to, a lot around the way that a host or a, one of the news anchors or whatever will speak. And it goes kind of like this. If somebody clearly is, um, let's say they're interviewing someone who is like-minded. So in other words, they're on their side. They will say things like, well, tell us about your opinions about this new law or tell, your, tell us your opinions about this new thing that's happening in courts or whatever it is. And they'll give them room to speak and they'll affirm it. They'll say, that's right. That's right. That's a very good point. They'll use that kind of language. Um, and, but if they're talking to if they're talking about someone who they disagree with, here's where the kind of signal comes in. They'll say, that's right. 
That's right. This is what they said. Here it is. We'll play the recording. And that's okay to play a recording of what Sun says. I think is totally fair game. But then they'll say something like, you see, they don't care about you. They only care about this. And both sides use those exact same words. Hmm. And if you listen to that, it's like, how can they possibly know what someone else's motivation is? So once you hear someone on either side of the aisle telling you what the motivation is of the other side, there's an inherent lie in that, or there's at least an inherent chance for it to be because you don't know. You don't know why someone is passionate about what they're passionate about. Um, and what I found by watching both sides, this is actually kind of depressing. When I started watching both <laughs> sides, I realized that both sides, when I listen to them now, get me depressed. Because if I'm listening to the side I don't like, of course, they're telling me I'm stupid. But if I listen to the side that I agree with, all they do is tell me about all the bad things that the other side is doing to ruin my life. And I just come away going, gosh, this is just, it's too much. Um, I i don't know. I'd love to see, and it, I don't put, put this on the media or anything, so I would love to see society get to the point where we just kind of go, blah, blah, blah. Okay. When I need my little fix from my side, I'll go listen to it for a while, and then I get myself all... Actually, though, it doesn't make me happy. It just gets me agitated at the other side. But I'll get my little fix. Um, but it doesn't solve it because no one's changing their minds. And I also see this on Facebook. I have friends on both sides of the aisle, and they just, they literally will call the other people names, tell them they're stupid. I don't know how people think this is on the communication side of things. It's very really frustrating. I don't see how people think that's having any kind of positive impact on it. Well, it's interesting. I mean, when you think of negotiation, because I've been involved in fair amount of negotiation, you're having to convince someone who wants some, at least some things that are the opposite of what you want. And you somehow have to convince them to agree with you to, to a degree. Some people do this by getting angry and yelling and calling names, hoping that they can bully someone into doing what they want, which is kind of like that. Or, um, and there's a book by Chris Voss, who was the FBI's leading uh, international hostage negotiator. So he knows a few things about negotiation. He wrote a book called Never Split the Difference. I just finished the audiobook. And um, there's a thing called tactical empathy. You have to first at least try to understand where the other person is coming from before you can even have a conversation. If you don't know what the other person wants, why they think what they think, then you're going to have absolutely no leverage in trying to convince them of anything. I think it's the same way, at least in these conversations, we have to first actually truly understand or try to understand why someone believes what they believe so that we can disagree on the things we actually disagree. And I think what was so sad with um, what happened in, in the school board is I don't, I honestly don't believe that the people who voted the way they did either um, some cared about students and some actually just didn't care about students. But everything was brought up about, obviously it's about the pride flags, but if it was started as, hey, what can we agree on and how can we, uh, how can we solve this goal? There may have been a solution. There may not have been, but I think that it was um, the name calling and in both, I watched, <laughs> I, was, I kind of was depressed by how it went. Like, neither side really seemed to care to to degree, I think there are some efforts of, of making it happen, but neither side said, you know, this is we we want to make sure that every child feels included and safe and well in the Newbridge schools. And if that was the foundation, and then how could we make that happen? There would probably still be disagreements, absolutely, and probably everyone would have voted the same way. But would it have been possible to start with that foundation and and go out from there? Uh, but you know, it's. Uh, well, here's, here's where it gets difficult, though, because, and this is why this is, this is why most people don't get involved with things like civility or <laughs> united or whatever, because it's, it's, it's uncomfortable in this regard. If we were talking about an issue, we, let's make up an issue. Should the sign, street signs in Newburgh be changed from green to yellow or from green to purple? Let's just say for some reason there's two camps. Some people want yellow signs. Some people want purple signs. 
Well, you can get all worked up about that. Actually, it is kind of interesting because you could get people in a frenzy over that, mm -hmm. uh, which doesn't matter. Um, but for the most part, people get worked up about the fact that um, issues come up in our culture that people truly believe are a matter of life and death, or it's a matter of survival or perishing, or um, it, it's going to make the world acceptable or unacceptable. And if you, if you think about it that way, if somebody were to come into your life, knock on your door of your house, come in and take away things from you or give things to force you to have things you don't want, it's, um, it's hostile. It feels frightening. We don't want to feel out of control. We don't want to feel controlled. We don't want to feel manipulated. We don't want to feel things forced upon us that we don't want. So most of the stuff that comes up that if, that's caused this are things that people are that deeply passionate about. They either have a religious belief, a moral belief, um, combination of things, personal experience, somebody they know that's got this issue or that issue, and someone is trying to change the world about that issue, and people care deeply. Yeah. So, but here's the problem. If you, if you can't, as one person, stop half of society from thinking differently. Yeah. Um, so what can you do? And again, this is where I go back to the communication side of things. It is so not useful to start turning people into demons and threatening people. I mean, we had almost, uh, almost forms of violence done against people in this town under the name of a cause. And I guess it is just no matter how much you may believe based on your faith or your morals or your values that something's right or wrong, no one ever gives you the right to tell someone else what their morals or values or beliefs are. They just, we just don't have that right. No one has ever given us that right. Yeah. Any talent. And so we have to grow up, if you will, wear the big boy pants or whatever you want to call it and say, gosh, I live in a world where people can disagree with me and they can be just as passionate about something or against something that I am, does that mean I have to go out and seek to destroy them or try to turn them into demons or whatever? Mm -hmm. And I don't see why, I, I, I guess I get why we do that because we're afraid and we get angry, so we lash out, but it doesn't help the cause. It doesn't even help my call yeah. to do that. So what are the ways, given media is going to be around, Social media is going to be around. People who disagree very strongly are going to be routed. There's still going to be trolls and people who just want to start arguing. So given all of that, that's not going to change. What are some tangible things that people listening to this who care, maybe they're listening to this as people have died, said, okay, maybe I'm going to think twice. I'm not going to do that anymore. Or maybe it's we encounter people who are, who are that way. Um, but one way or another, we want, we want to be more united as neighbors, as as Agree on it. So from what you found through the conversations you as a group had or just things that you've learned, what are some tangible things that we can actually do? Well, I'll I'll give you some personal examples. So I recently lost a bit of weight and it took um, a lot of work. It was hard. It took me a good six to eight months to lose about 25 pounds. And, and I've done it before and kept it off for a while and then it comes back because human nature is such that I like the food I like, and things like that happen. But when you force yourself, when you say to yourself, I care more about the result of what I weigh or how healthy I am than I do about the food, then with time, it, it, I don't know if it becomes easier, but you become better practiced at accomplishing it. Um, well, I discovered the same thing about being involved with this project. It used to be that if somebody opened their mouths and I could hear they were on the other side, I immediately got literally itchy and I I got anxious and I just either wanted to shut them up or leave. It's just kind of how I felt. And I quickly, I don't know if you noticed this, as soon as someone speaks and you think they don't agree with you, you stop listening and your brain starts going into prepare the attack. What are the things I'm going to counter this statement? How can I prove them wrong? And what I've learned through this process is um, I've become, and some people will not like this in a sense, but I've become more comfortable being with people I disagree with. 
Um, it hasn't changed my opinions. I haven't quote unquote lost my moral compass or my faith or anything like that. But I have found it's a worthwhile exercise because it's always a good thing to be able to keep your cool and be a grown up, so to speak, and be somebody who's trying to contribute to a solution rather than somebody who just reacts and takes a shot at somebody or flames somebody else or something. So, so the long answer to your question is I encourage people in this time of division to get involved with something that forces you to practice not changing your mind and not changing someone else's mind, but becoming more comfortable with the fact that people are allowed to exist with different opinions. How about when you, when you see something on social media and you just, you feel like you've got all the right rebuttals, what do you do? Well, I, I think my record on social media is either a hundred percent or close to a hundred percent. If I went back 10 years, I might be able to find a comment I once made or two here or there about flaming somebody for the beliefs. But I made a decision quite a few years ago. I don't care who's posting whatever stuff that gets me furious. I'm not going to engage because the reason I have quote unquote friends on social media is because I like seeing pictures from their vacation, I like seeing pictures of their grandkids. I like seeing the new house that they're building. I like connecting with people and I've connected with people. I'm more friends now with some people I went to high school with four years ago, whatever it was, than I was in high school. And I don't know why people think social media is a great place to destroy other people. It's, it's, it's not kind of too bad though, but, but it, people do use it that way. You no, know, it's, it's, I, my response is, I say, I don't know why you think Facebook is a good place to be talking about this. Just friend, you can't, um, yeah. So for people, well, what would you say for someone who, who is the kind of person who engages, what would be a better way than obviously to, well, this goes right again, this is my profession of communication. So again, I don't care what your topic is, what your point of view is. If you want to win people over, or you want to at least educate people about what you're about, you share valuable information. If you're, if you look at the best posts there are on Facebook, let's say from a financial planner or a real estate agent, or somebody who's in marketing or somebody who's in, who does home construction, they share tips. They, they will say, Hey, did you realize this is a great way to save money? This is a great way to uh, improve your house. This is a great way to find that new house. And they share information. And if it is something of interest to people, they'll start reading it and incorporating it with how they think. You really don't get many converts by saying, I think you're stupid and I want to destroy it. How, who in the world is going to listen to that and become a better person? So, but there's a for some reason, there's a desire that at CNB, I'm not above it. I will read some post from some relative or friend that just gets me angry and yeah. I want to attack. So far, I'm pretty, <laughs> I, I think that's a hundred percent or at least it has been for the last 10 years that I just don't engage. You know, that's a really good point because I, I used to really value being right or at least feeling like I was right. Recognizing well, what's the point in that? And I've just tried to gauge is this person asking a genuine question because they're curious or if they're on a rant recognizing, no, they're not willing to have a conversation or they're not willing to potentially have their mind changed. So I just kind of nod and listen or just say, oh, finger. maybe, oh, it's really interesting. How did you come to believe that or feel that way? Or have you considered this? Or what are your thoughts about this position from the other side? You kind of gave the arc. Are they are they wanting to just blast everything, or are they will have conversation? And it's made it a lot easier for me to just have conversations with people who feel really different. But for me, I don't get really that like the anxious feeling at all anymore because I get why people believe what they do. And sure, I may disagree, but I think when we understand, I mean, it's that old I don't know we knew where the saying came from: seek first to understand, and then to be understood. I think everyone's heard that <laughs> we don't actually take it to heart, but it's true. It, we have to seek to understand, and then we can at least not be angry 
that someone believes something. Well, but there's the key that you used. We don't have to. That's that's the secret is we don't have to. We can just react. I could just be angry that I, that you don't agree with me. But with regard to this project or this sort of work, um, that's where the opportunity is because you don't have to seek to understand. But if you choose to, um, and I, I caution people, I think it takes a tremendous amount of emotional um, exercise or emotional self-control or emotional confidence to go seek somebody out who you know disagrees with you who's going to push your buttons. And, and instead of being ready to defend yourself or attack, to say, they don't, I don't have to change my mind just because they're talking, just because they're passionate. I don't have to change my mind. So maybe if I can relax and be comfortable that I'm secure in what I think and believe, I could just ask them, oh, that's interesting. Let's say they said something that was totally inflammatory, just absolutely the opposite of what I agree, of what I believe. I could say, well, tell me why you feel that. Give me some information. Explain to me more. Um, boy, I, I'm still not convinced. What, what else do you have? It's hard to do that because it sort of feels like going out into battle without any armor on. And, and I don't know what they're going to, are they going to snatch us? Are they going to, you know, we're going to yeah. accidentally find ourselves on the wrong side or whatever. I think emotionally that's what goes on inside of people. Yeah. So it's much easier to put up the fence and say, I don't want to let this touch me. Yeah. But I think that's why we're in the situation we're in. Yeah. So given this and given what you've been seeing with United as Neighbors, what, what would you say your hope is for the future of United as Neighbors? Well, I wrote a little um, fantasy newspaper article about a year ago, which helped. I always like to begin something by saying, "Where would this? here's how I'll define success for myself. This is what it would look like. And then I work backward. Mm -hmm. In order for that to be true, what would I have to do? And I, uh, it, it goes something like, so I pretended like it was a, an article in the word graphic and it said, today, and I don't remember the exact words, but something like, today, um, there was a, a national news um, report about what's happening in Newburgh, here at Newburgh. Um, in spite of all the division that's happened in our town, we've got people sitting together in coffee shops at chapters and, um, you know, coffee cottage and coffee cat sitting across the table, absolutely disagreeing with each other, but doing it singly and having a cup of coffee and a scone and talking to each other. And it's become so well known that people from other towns are coming here to try to learn. And how did this little town of Newburgh, Oregon do this? What are they doing here? And it's not like I have the answer to how to do that. Yeah. But wouldn't that be great if we became a national news story? Because somehow, in spite of all the differences that there are here, just like in the rest of the country, this town rose above the, the urge to destroy each other and said there's something more important to do which is to honor people even as you disagree with them. To, because if you honor someone else and they're right to disagree with you, you're honoring yourself and you're honoring everybody. You're elevating everybody. You're saying every human being matters and you're allowed to have your opinion. And I, I might disagree with your opinion. I might challenge you. I might debate you. I might vote against you, but I'm not going to dishonor you. Mm -hmm. I think that's sort of the dream that I've had. Yeah. I like that. And I like that story too. I want to see that happen. Yeah. I'm like, what? So then given all that, what gives you hope about your future? Um, well, I, not to be a downer, but I don't know if I have hope. <laughs> I'm hoping I have hope. Um, I, I think the only thing you can do with that sort of thing is, is look at yourself. And what I have noticed is a year of doing this makes me slightly less uncomfortable being in a group of four people who all disagree with me, I feel a little less threatened. I feel a little less like I have to defend myself. Um, and on the other side of that, I find myself when I'm in a group of people who all agree with me, I find it almost a little tiring because uh, having spent some time listening to both both of the news you know, types of organizations, uh, both sides call the other side hypocrites. And... 
At first, of course, when somebody calls me a hypocrite, I'm angry. Um, and I just want to call them a hypocrite. I want to find all the reasons why they're a hypocrite. And I'm only a hypocrite twice and they're a hypocrite. Three times, three times I win. And that's kind of how I think. But um, so it's, I think I, I would just put it as there's a way of conditioning ourselves, whether it was how to lose weight things you choose to read or the places you choose to go, the entertainment you choose to watch, you can condition yourself to, um, to be different than you are. And for some people that may sound bad or scary if they think that means they're going to go down a bad path or a dark path. And that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about conditioning yourself to be kinder, to be more understanding of differences. And that, by the way, as we age, I think the only thing you have um, as an advantage as you age, because it's not strength anymore and it's not how quick you are or whatever, it's what might be some wisdom that can form around, maybe I don't have to argue everything. Maybe I don't have to win every fight. Maybe there is another role to be played. And in a town that's been hurting pretty bad, I think we need some of that. Yeah. Well, thank you, Brian, for sharing your thoughts, sharing your wisdom, and for doing the work you're doing. It does take a lot of energy, but I appreciate you taking the time to to be involved with United as Neighbors and uh, to do whatever you can to make New York a more pleasant place to be. Thank you. I do have one closing thing in that regard. United is Neighbors is not my project. I didn't start this project. There are lots of people involved. I'm one of the members, but we have Ron Mott from George Fox. He is, is a big part of it. Uh, Mayor Rick Rogers was part of forming this group. Uh, Polly Peterson here in town has been part of forming this group. And I'm just one of the voices that's um, trying to help move things forward with a focus on the communication side. And there are other folks too that are involved. So yeah, well, um, now that people learn more about United yeah, Neighbors, that's a good thing. We don't have a website or anything yet, so they can certainly reach out to um, uh, the, any of the subgroups who do have websites. Like I do, Nurture Newberg has a website. You with your uh, Giving Town have a podcast and a website. I don't even know if we have an agenda item to make a website. We probably should. Um, but you can certainly reach out to those people or to Ron or Polly or Mir Rogers as well. Okay. Well, thank you, Brian. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode. And I hope you enjoyed hearing about the efforts across town to unite our community and bring people together. More importantly, I hope you are inspired to learn more about these projects and get involved. I believe that if we can learn to honor and respect the people we disagree with the most, despite how hard that may be, we might actually have a chance to see Brian's future vision of Newberg coming to pass. So if you enjoy these episodes and are finding value in them, please consider subscribing to the podcast and sharing these episodes with people who you think would enjoy them and find value in them. Well, thank you for tuning in and I'll catch you in the next episode.